In the last video, we discussed how we manage tools with libraries. Now in this video, we're going to look at how new tools are created. Although we're going to focus on milling tools, the same concepts can be applied to any other tool type. If you plan on following along, you should either have your file open from the last video, or you can open Assembly 3.0 now. Because we're not going to be making any meaningful changes to this assembly, there's no need to save a copy of it. Tools can be created in two ways. On the fly for the current job, or by adding it to one of our libraries. On the fly means that a tool is set for the current job only and will not be saved for future use. This option works well for tools that are used infrequently that would otherwise simply clutter your library. However, if you think you're going to use a tool again, you may want to add it to a library. If you add a tool to the library, it will then be copied from the library to the current file when you decide to use it on a particular job. Again, remember, a library is only useful if you can rely on it. So, if there's junk in the library, you don't know what you can trust and what you can't. Only keep tools in your library that you can rely on. That said, you may create a custom library for oddball tools. To begin the process of creating our new tool, we need to start by opening the tool library. That of course is found on the CAM tab of the SOLIDWORKS Command Manager, and we can then select Tool Library. To create a new tool, we first need to define where the tool is going to be created. Remember we had the option of adding it to a tool library or creating it on the fly. If your active file is selected, the tool is going to be created on the fly and just added to this particular file. However, if you want the tool added to a library, then you need to select the library. Let's go ahead and select the library in my libraries that we set up in the last lesson. With the library selected, we can select New Mill Tool, and we now know we're creating a tool that's going to be saved in our personal library. Depending on where the tool window was, the last time it was opened, the tab you're on currently may be different than mine. So let's go ahead and select the General tab to make sure we're all at the same starting point. HSMWorks automatically assigns a tool number. In my case, that's 1. If your CNC machine has a tool changer, this would be the pocket that the tool is kept in. It doesn't matter what the number is, as it's very easy to change later when we're using the tool for a specific operation. Also, it's very seldom that your length offset or diameter offset would be a different number than the tool number. You can add more detailed information about the tool like a description, comment, vendor, and product ID. Although this information is not used by HSMWorks and is optional for our tool library, it is very useful for when we need to reorder a broken tool. So let's go ahead and fill that in now. When entering a description, it's a wise idea to come up with company guidelines so that all of your tool descriptions appear similarly. Let's start by entering the diameter of our tool. I'll enter 3 divided by 8 followed by the diameter symbol. Here's a quick tip. To get a diameter symbol, hold ALT, followed by entering the following numbers, 0, 2, 1, 6, and then release ALT. This inserts a diameter symbol. Add a comma, and let's describe our tool. It's going to be a 2, flute, comma, single, end, High Speed Steel, HSS, End Mill. So we have a description that should match the tool we're going to order. We can add a comment. Comments could be things like Uncoded. Our vendor in this case is McMaster Car, so I'll enter McMaster Car. Now the tool we're creating is actually in the McMaster Car catalog and that number is 3051A15. With all of the general information of our tool set, 
we can move on to the Cutter tab. On the Cutter tab, we define the tool geometry. First, select the drop down for the tool type. As we select different tool types, the diagram and required dimensions change. In our case, we want to use a flat end mill. So, from the drop down, select flat end mill. The dimensions for the tool can be found in your tool catalog or by measuring the tool with a vernier caliper. In our case, we're going to be using a diameter of 3 eighths of an inch. This can be entered in fractional format or decimal format. Let's type 3 divided by 8. For the flute length, we're going to use 9 divided by 16. Notice, as you modify these values, the image on the right hand side is updated in real time. For the shoulder length, again we're going to use 9 sixteenths. Shoulder length is always going to be the same as flute length when the diameter and shaft diameter are equal. That said, your shaft diameter should be 3 eighths of an inch. If it's not, enter it now. Finally, the body length describes how far the tool extends out of the tool holder. It must be longer than the shoulder length. When you're setting your tool up in a tool holder, you want to keep this length as short as possible to reduce tool deflection or vibration, but long enough to ensure that the tool holder clears any clamps. That's why entering this dimension into the tool page is important. So, later on, we can check to see if the tool holder actually does clear those clamps during the machining process. To get this value, you may need to physically put the tool in a tool holder and measure it. Now in our case, we're going to enter a value of 3 quarters of an inch. Finally, we need to enter the overall length. I want to enter 2 and 5 sixteenths. So I'll type 2 plus 5 divided by 16. When I press enter, HSMWorks will convert that to a decimal value. I will also note in the bottom left hand corner there's a drop down to change the units. We're going to skip over the shaft tab, the holder tab, and the holder geometry tab. The next tab we're going to look at is the feeds and speeds tab. The feed and speed tab is where default cutting speeds and feeds are calculated and set. Begin by setting the number of flutes to 2 and entering a surface speed of 600. This value can be obtained from cutter data or in the resources for lesson 3. The spindle speed was now calculated based on the surface speed and tool diameter. It's a good practice to round this value off to the closest 100 RPM. Remember, even the best speeds and feed data are a good estimate at best. So rounding is not a problem. It makes the program easier to read. So let's round our spindle speed to 6100. We can now enter a feed per tooth of 6 thousandths of an inch. That's decimal 006. Again, recommended cutting speeds are calculated. These should also be rounded so that there's no fractional feed rates. We're going to set our cutting feed rates to 73. The plunge feed rate can be set to 24, and that also updates our ramp feed rate. The only time you shouldn't change the feed rates, and fractional feed rates should be used, is when we're tapping. Because when we're tapping, it's very important that the spindle speed is appropriately linked to the feed rate. Well, with that said, we've established our first tool. We can select OK and it's been added to our custom tool library. With that, I hope you now feel like you understand how tools are handled and you feel comfortable creating your own tools.